Hi folks, welcome to part 10 of our fixturing recap series. Today we're gonna to focus on fourth axis work holding and then fifth axis work holding. Before we dive in, we created a PDF that summarizes all of the 10 fixturing techniques we covered through this recap series. Download it, use it as a reference, use it as a guide. We talk about the pros and the cons of each of those techniques. Hopefully it serves as a resource when you're trying to figure out the best way to hold that part. Okay, let's dive in. In the nine videos that we've done on our part recap series to date, most of them cover things like three axis milling or turning, both of which are situations where your tool is perpendicular to your part and thus the size and shape of the work holding that vice or chuck or fixture plate didn't really matter because it was never the case that the, the shank of your tool or the tool holder itself would come into contact with the actual work holding device. Well, that all changes with fourth and fifth axis work because so often our part's gonna be tipped over permanently or it's actually gonna be moving dynamically. So we care a lot more about making sure the size of the work holding device itself is appropriate for the machine and the part we're making. This is why bigger is not always better. If you're machining a small part, you don't want a five axis machine with hatchet, which has a really large platter or trunnion because when you tip that up, it's gonna make it really difficult, if not impossible, for the spindle and the tool holder and the tool itself to reach down to that part. Same thing with fourth axis. If you have a relatively short part, but you have a really large, say a three jaw chuck, you're either going to have to extend your tool out really far or stick the workpiece out far to get access to it. That being said, for basic fourth axis work, absolutely keep a three or four jaw chuck in your toolbox, but stick around. In this video, we'll talk about different four and five axis work holding devices that can help you based on what style and size part you have. One thing that's worth noting, on the NYC CNC website, we have cam tutorials specifically here on fourth axis. One of the most common questions that we get, especially for folks using Tormach machines or similar, is what happens when you're getting cam errors. Short explanation is that your work coordinate system needs to be located at the X, Z center of your rotation. We go into that in more detail in those videos. If you're stepping up to a vertical machining center, most of them now either include or have as an option something called dynamic work offsets. It's really cool. It means your work coordinate system does not need to be on your point of rotation. The most common thing we've seen on fourth axis work holding is either a collet system or a chuck. Here we've got the micro arc using a collet system, commonly either ERs or five Cs. The nice thing about this relative to a traditional three or four jaw lathe chuck it's a smaller diameter, which gives you better access to the part without having to use extended length holders or cutting tools. We saw a similar technique during our Area 419 shop tour. What I love about this setup is they have the ER collet on a rock lock base. This makes the fixture itself removable and it makes the fourth axis a lot more modular in terms of what you wanna set up or run on it. They're using a tail stock on the left to stabilize the rifle barrel and one of the coolest and most ingenious things I've seen for fourth axis or large part work holding here is they designed a floating support you see in the middle of the barrel. This has slots that allows the operator to adjust that support depending on the rifle barrel's taper or contours and it provides a stabilization. Think of it like a steady rest on a lathe so that when they're in this case fluting the barrel, the barrel's not prone to chatter or vibration. Moving outside the traditional fourth axis work holding of chucks or collets, we had to make a large quantity of these blocks that had holes drilled at different angles. I wanted to do it on the fourth axis, but I had to figure out how to hold the material in a way that would let us do a small production run of these parts. So we built a trunnion. The trunnion held our raw material and it let us use the tool orientation feature within Fusion 360 to easily program spotting and drilling these holes at the various different angles. Next up, your material itself can be the fixture. Here we're back on the micro arc, but we stacked it up on a couple of risers so that our part could swing and clear the machine table. We then took this piece of material and we did kind of an op zero where we machined a boss into the edge of it. And then we directly clamped the piece of raw material into the micro arc and let that serve as our fixture. It worked great and the workpiece itself was surprisingly rigid. Next up, it's the story of the most complicated part that we have ever made. Now it happens to be on a five axis, but this strategy can apply to three, four or five axis machining. The situation at hand was we'd done the majority of the machining of this part 
in the first operation. No, we do not have any features on this part right now that will let us machine either a datum or act as a fixture for op2. But that trick is beautifully simple. We can add one. Take a piece of material. In this case, we machined it ahead of time and we're going to bolt it on to our part. It's going to kind of become one with the material. Our part is still secured in our op one vise. The machine and fusion knows exactly where everything is on that part. Before we unclamp the vise, we're going to machine some features into it. And the beauty of this is we now have a totally removable fixture where we've machined precise locating planes, datums, edges, etc. whatever you want, probing bores into it that will then serve as our OP2 coordinate system and our OP2 work holding so that we can machine the bottom part of this workpiece away. And when we are done, we simply unscrew the piece of aluminum that we use as that OP2 fixture. This technique also works for lighter duty materials like plastics and mold waxes with just super glue. Here though, because we're machining metal or aluminum, we wanted the mechanical security of a true screw to attach our OP2 temporary fixture to the part. And the last two videos focus mostly on five axis work holding. The first was a video we did on how and why to use dovetail fixturing and the tips and tricks around it. Programming workflows, raw material workflows, how to make or even buy dovetailed material. And we walked through a number of really good fixturing examples where we've seen dovetail fixtures in use. And finally, a video dedicated to tabbing off or finishing strategies on five axis workflows. Starting with a strategy using thicker tabs, very useful when there's already going to be a secondary operation where you can machine away that thicker tab. Moving on to thinner tabs, doing multiple tabs along the same plane, and then improving that with multiple tabs along different planes. Again, focusing not only on the work holding side of it, but how you set this up and program this on the CAD and CAM side and wrapping up with some more window machining tips and tricks, including either leaving small tabs or using hot glue to pot the part in place and actually finish machine every single surface of a workpiece in a single setup with no downstream post-processing deburring, et cetera, required. If you're getting started or even thinking about jumping into the world of five axis machine, check out our getting started guide. We've got more information and tips and workflows on everything from CAD to CAM to setup to simulation and five axis machining examples. That concludes part 10 of our fixture recap series. We'll have all the videos for part 10 and the other 10 videos that we did on the fixture recap series all listed out over on the NYC CNC website. We hope this serves as a great resource for you. It's one of the things that we enjoy the most about machining is seeing creative and new ways to think about fixturing and holding parts. Sometimes when you're stuck, the best thing to do is just go look through others' examples to help spur that creativity or that ingenuity. But as always, folks, hope you learned something. Hope you enjoyed. Take care. See you soon.